Imagine you're a skilled ethical hacker, ready to take on your next target. You've got your laptop, and are ready to exploit any vulnerabilities you can find. But which tools should you use? Well don't worry, that's exactly what I'll be covering in this video, walking you through everything from why hackers use certain tools, to the different situations they're built for, and where they fit into the bigger picture of hacking, so let's get started. This video is sponsored by Any.Run, more on that later. Disclaimer. The following content is for cybersecurity enthusiasts and is for educational or awareness purposes only. It does not provide step-by-step -step instructions on how hacking tools are used, but rather explains why they're used by both both hackers and security professionals to ethically test systems or defend against attacks. Black hat hacking is highly discouraged and can result in serious legal consequences. Chapter number one, reconnaissance. Okay so starting with the first step of hacking, reconnaissance is the act of gathering information about a target before a hacker tries to hack them, and this is where they use a variety of different tools depending on the type of target they want to hack. So for example, if a hacker is already connected to a network, and wants to scan for all the other devices on it, they can simply use a tool called nmap, and run a basic command to list all the devices along with their private IP addresses like this. The thing that makes nmap powerful is that it can also perform a stealthy scan to avoid detection, find out what operating system a device is running, and even highlight vulnerable services like RDP, SMB, or Apache, which can then be used to gain access to a system, steal sensitive files, or even deliver a malware or payload to that system. Now while we'll cover what this means in the next chapter, of the video, you should know that Nmap basically lets you walk through a building and check which windows are open, so they can be used to get inside later on. Then there's Shodan, which works in a similar way, but instead of just scanning a local network, it searches the entire internet for devices that are publicly exposed. So for example, if a hacker wants to find all the devices running RDP over the internet, they could simply search for its port number like this, and Shodan would list all the remote desktops it can find. This makes it easier for hackers to discover devices that could be at risk all over the world, and while Shodan can also filter devices by their location or in organization, its real strength lies in the fact that it can also reveal exposed infrastructure like traffic lights or power grids, which were never meant to be online. Then there are tools like Whois or DNS lookups, which let a hacker find out who owns a website and where it's hosted, while others like Directory Buster are used to map hidden pages or old admin panels within a website, which could then be used as entry points by hackers. Finally, resources like the OSINT framework list dozens of tools for finding information about people, which could then be used to social engineer them, while others like HDSDR allow you to scan nearby radio signals, but we'll talk more about this later in the video. Chapter number 2, Exploitation. Okay so after reconnaissance is done, the next step is to actually exploit the vulnerabilities found, and this stage also relies on a variety of different tools depending on the type of system being targeted. So for example, if a hacker discovers a device running an old Apache server on a network, they could then use a tool like Metasploit or the Exploit Database, to find an exploit related to that vulnerable Apache server, and use it to deliver a malware or payload to that server. Or if they come across a remote desktop that they can simply try and log into, they might use multiple password crackers to brute force its password, but we'll talk about those in the next chapter of the video. Finally, if an attacker was trying to hack a system by delivering malware through phishing emails, they might use multiple tools for post-exploitation and persistence, but since this is a much deeper topic, I'd recommend you watching this video by clicking on the i button above. For websites, hackers often rely on tools like Burp Suite, which acts as a middleman between your browser and a website, letting you see and edit everything in between. This allows a hacker to do things like injecting malicious inputs into a website to see how it reacts, and while there are other specialized tools like SQL Map or XSS Strike for testing websites, Burp Suite stands out because it combines everything into a single platform, allowing hackers to test vulnerabilities in one place. Next, the social engineering toolkit is used to craft phishing emails or clone websites, which can then be used to deliver malware or steal login credentials, while others like the browser exploitation framework allow hackers to hack web browsers and steal cookies or hijack session tokens. Finally, tools like air cracking or better cap can be used to exploit Wi-Fi networks, while others like the hack RF1 allow hackers to tamper with multiple radio devices, but we'll talk more about these later in the video. Chapter number 3, Password Attacks Passwords are what protect our zip files, lock our devices, secure our Wi-Fi networks, and of course guard our online accounts. However, the thing that all of these have in common is that once you set up a password on any of them, they usually store that internally within a file or a database, to compare and check whether a typed password at the time of login is correct or not. This is a problem because hackers can sometimes gain access to these files or databases, and steal the passwords stored inside. However, since these passwords are not stored as plain text, but rather in the form of something called a hash, the challenge then becomes cracking those hashes to figure out what the original password was. This is where password cracking comes into play. Now depending on the type of password a hacker is trying to crack, they may use a variety of different tools. So for example, in order to crack passwords of zip files or stolen databases, hackers often use tools like Hashcat or John, since they both work offline and can test millions of passwords, while others like Hydra are used to crack passwords online, and brute force servers or remote desktops. 
Wi-Fi passwords are usually cracked using tools like air cracking or reaver, while Bluetooth pins may be attacked with specialized tools like crackle, but we'll talk more about these later in the video. Chapter number four, wireless attacks. Okay, so now that we've looked at everything from passwords to systems, and even users to websites, let's now move on to a whole new category of hacking, called wireless attacks. Wireless attacks are what let attackers do everything from intercepting to jamming wireless signals, and so depending on the type of technology a hacker is trying to hack, they may use a variety of different tools, starting with air cracking or kismet. Air cracking is a Wi-Fi cracking tool, that allows a hacker to capture something called a handshake from a targeted router, which is then used to crack that Wi-Fi's password offline, while kismet is a network discovery tool, used to map all the hidden Wi-Fi Wi-Fi's nearby. Next, BetterCap is used to perform a man-in-the-middle attack over Wi-Fi, and capture sensitive files or login data being sent over a network, while the DStyke D author watch is simply used to jam Wi-Fi signals. Finally, Bluetooth is hacked using specialized tools like Ubertooth 1, while others like the hack RF1 allow hackers to mess with everything from key fobs to satellite systems, but you can learn more about these by watching these videos. Chapter number 5, Forensics and Investigation. Okay so up until now, all we've been talking about were tools which are used by both hackers to break into systems, or by defenders to ethically test those systems, but not all tools are about breaking in. Some are just about watching closely or tracking the traces left behind, and this is where forensic tools come into play. Now just like the previous chapters, depending on the type of forensics a hacker or a defender is trying to perform, they may use a variety of different tools, starting with autopsy. Autopsy is a system forensics tool that lets a defender recover deleted files or restore browser history, while Splunk is used to collect activity logs and detect anomalies. Wireshark is a network analysis tool that you can learn more about by watching this video, while Snort is used to inspect data packets in real time and spot suspicious activity. Speaking of spotting suspicious activity, the next tool on our list is by the sponsor of this video Any.run. AnyRun is a malware analysis sandbox that helps businesses and defenders analyze how a malware behaves by running it in a controlled environment, and so if we wanted to analyze a malware from scratch, we could either upload a sample directly from here, or pick one from a vast library of submissions to choose from. What's nice about AnyRun is that it lets you customize your entire sandbox, from selecting the operating system or runtime, to enabling features like automated interactivity, which auto-clicks through installers or phishing pages, and helps you trigger malware that tries to evade analysis. After a malware is up and running, AnyRun will provide you with multiple analysis tabs, each giving you a different view of what the malware is actively doing behind the scenes. So for example, the network tab here shows you all the network connections a malware is making, which may include things like when a dropper downloads a payload from an external server, or when a payload connects to a C2 server to receive commands or exfiltrate data. Then there's the process tree, which gives you a full breakdown of what the malware is actively doing, and whether it's executing any specific commands, or modifying registry keys. This is a big deal because seeing everything in action helps you determine how the attack unfolds, or even interact with the malware like a real victim would. And while I can't go through all the other amazing products any run offers, like TI Lookup, for quickly checking if an IP address is linked to threats, or TI feeds that provide live data about malicious sites and servers, you can try it for free using your business email, and explore the rest for yourself. It's a great tool to either study how a malware behaves, or reverse engineer its functionality without needing to run it on your own computer. Anyway guys so that's it for the video, if you have any questions, feel free to ask them in the comments section down below, and I'll see you in the next one.